All right, with that, let's get rolling. So first off, thanks everyone for joining today's talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, I know it's been the end of a long day and, it, and it's a weird time, uh, but uh, we're gonna end it on an, on an interesting note. If you've had your fill of talking about software and design theory and architectural patterns, well, you're not gonna get any of that here today. This is a, this is a talk where you don't need to worry about taking away any of the code from it, but we are gonna see a little bit of code as we go along. Don't worry also if you're if you're um, <clears throat> don't have an engineering background or aren't really even sure at all about how any of the hardware works. That's the purpose of today's talk. And the good news is that <clears throat> even if um, you know even as technology evolves all the time and we come up with new ways of building machines, the principles that we're going to show of how CPUs work today have been true for the past uh, almost forty years, about thirty five years, and there's no signs that they're not going to maintain and stay true for the next twenty. So this will be useful throughout the, you know, your whole career. So with that, let's get rolling. Let's start with what is a CPU? What's actually the bits? Why do we even have something called a CPU? And what we're going to do is introduce a look, a conceptual model of the way processors work and how they evolved from scratch. Uh, so with that, it was originally called the uh, von Neumann architecture. But what we're going to present today for technologists who want to double check me is referred to as a modified Harvard architecture, which is basically what every modern processor is all the way up through you know arm chips in your iphones and in android phones uh through to modern pcs intel processors etc so let's start from scratch let's just say you want to make a machine that can do something useful and let's start off with just some basic math i want to be able to take some value a some value b add them together and make c how do i make that happen well Starts off with, I need a logic unit. I need something that can actually understand what is math? What's it mean to add something together and get a result? Now, I also have that A, B, and C, the variables. So I'm gonna have to have some way of storing that value A, that value B, and the result C. Because if I can't vary those things, if I've just hard coded to add say one plus four and get an outcome, the outcome is the same every time, it's not useful. It's not really a machine. So instead we have to have a little bit of story for A, B, plug that into our logic unit and be able to get that result C. Now it gets a little more elaborate because of course, if something can only add, <clears throat> something can only add, there's real limitations on what you can get out of that. It's not much of a machine, is it? So instead we wanna be able to uh, do more than just addition. We wanna be able to do a variety of operations. So to do that, our logic unit's gonna need a control unit that can tell it what is the thing we want to do. And of course, not just it doesn't just need a control unit to put it in that position, you know, in the configuration where it can do that add, subtract, multiply, divide. We also need to be able to like tell it which one we want at a given moment. Some way of saying to it, oh, at the moment we want you to do a subtract or an add or a divide. And if so, of the of the operands in what order for something that's order dependent, like um, like division. So already now we've built up a number of pieces to that. We have a little storage A and B. We have a result storage, that control unit tells the logic unit what position to be in and an instruction we can feed into it what to do. But of course, if we can only work from straight inputs, we have real limitations. We wanna be able to, to, in fact, at least do something where we can say either, say a, a value A and a value, uh, second value, or um, we need to be able to basically feed back results into ourselves. So it could be like A or memory plus C equals D as an example. So we need some place to store outputs because otherwise we have basically a pocket calculator where you have to have in your head what the um, what the current state is to then feed it manually back in. And that's not really useful. So instead we wanna have some result storage and be able to take that result and use that result as part of our input value uh, so that we could take, say for example, do a addition between either A or memory and another value to get a new result. So we can accumulate results over time. Of course, to do that, we've now introduced some way of routing data from, say, data storage into our inputs again, which means you have to extend our control unit to be able to tell those things what position we want them to be in uh, at a given time. Extending that then a little bit more beyond just the ability to have accumulation variables and that kind of thing, we get to sort of the full form of this, which is we want to be able to take, say, you know, an, a result from previous from memory or a new value and another known value and do a computation on them and take that result and either just have it, or we wanna be able to store that back into memory so we can use it in some subsequent operation. By the time we do this, if we then just introduce 
a little bit of instruction storage so we can sequence not just doing one step, but a sequence of steps we want to do, we have basically created a modern processor. And in fact, if you go from this di diagram right here where we have um, our instruction storage, we have you know, instruction storage here, we have an instruction that's the instruction we're currently using, that is the one that's controlling the this, this state of the processor. We have a control unit to put the processor in that state. And we have the ability to basically take memory and put it either into an A slot or B slot, take those two guys and do an operation we configure on them and put that result into a temporary buffer to then be able to move it back into memory. We now have the computers that we know today. And in fact, let me just now change all the labeling, gadunk, and this is now the diagram of the architecture of essentially every processor built since about 82. So I'm not lying when I say almost 40 years. Um, so yes, I can actually claim to have been around <laughs> and using computers back when this became the thing. Uh, but this is true whether you talk about a modern um, uh, ARM processor, uh, uh, one of the AX processors that Apple uses, uh, modern, any Intel processor, 64-bit, 32-bit, et cetera, they all use this basic hardware architecture to do what they're going to do. Now, by the way, as I go through this talk today, if you have any questions, uh, you can go to the conference room Slack channel and pound them on in there. If I don't get to them in the talk in flow, I guarantee you I'll get to it right after the talk and we can make sure your question gets answered. Um, but I really want to hear that feedback and, and, you know, make sure that I've hit the mark for you so that everyone's following along as we go. So we've laid out a basic diagram of the way a CPU works. And I've made this audacious claim that every modern CPU works this way. To justify that, let's get a little more detailed in what's going on and how this works. And it starts with something called an instruction. So the instruction is the thing that ultimately breaks down and differentiates different exact implementations of processors, like what makes an ARM uh, RISC processor fundamentally different than an Intel processor, fundamentally different than, say, the old MIPS processors we used to use, things like that. And it comes down to that instruction set. So what is an instruction that's part of that instruction set that defines what that hardware is capable of doing? Well, it turns out that to build a modern processor, you don't have to create a lot of unique instructions. And because these instructions are built into the hardware, there's a lot of pressure to be economical about how many of them you create. And more or less, what you need is to really do basic math, by which I mean that add, subtract, multiply, divide. Binary logic, so that's things like um, anding binary values together, oring binary values together to produce um, outcomes. Um, you want to be able to move things around uh, in RAM, so I can actually take something that's stored in one location, put it to another location, or put it into a variable, uh, or copy whole blocks of memory to other locations in memory to save them for later, et cetera. We need to have a thing called a stack, and that's that sta should stand out to you as a little weird. So we're talking about super low-level basic things, and then we say, oh yeah, and a stack. So just to refresh, what is a stack? Um, a stack is a specialized data structure that is best um, thought of actually is a pile of paper. And I'm looking around thinking that this is one time I could have actually made a prop with a pile of paper. So uh, the idea of a stack is you push things onto the stack and they layer up like this. And then when you pull something off the stack, what's called popping it, you're actually pulling off the top item. So you push items onto the stack and you pop them and the stack goes down. The interesting thing being that when you pop an item off the stack, you're getting the last item you put on the stack. So, they, so it's um, basically last in is the first out. So if I push one, two, three, I get back three, two, one. And that turns out that that basic behavior turns out to be extremely important to making any processor support any application of complexity. And you will see why in a little bit later on how that, that, that becomes an essential aspect. So an additional thing you need to be able to do is you have to be able to jump to a code location. So basically, if I think about my instructions set or the set of instructions that define a program, I need to be able to go like down the set of instructions and at some point be able to go like, uh, 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 from here, I want you to go way over there and start picking up things up again. Now, for anyone who's been in programming long enough, you know that, hey, this sounds like a go-to and gosh darn, we were told never to do that stuff again because it's super duper risky. And you're right. But at the low level of hardware, 
we economize things and there are no safeties at the low level of hardware. Uh, you make a misstep, everything just explodes. Uh, we rely on compilers and other high level things to keep us from making those mistakes. Finally, the last core bit of thing we really have to have to make a viable instruction set is uh, some sort of facility for doing a subroutine call and return. Because uh, you couldn't make a program of any complexity if you had to linearize the whole thing, where like all you could do is maybe do some jumps and and and, and jumps and the, the like, but you could never call a reusable block of code over and over and over again. And believe it or not, to make that work basically requires hardware support inside the microprocessor. And we're going to show how that works. But this set, this is all the CPU can do. And I want to differentiate for a second, like computing hardware from people. People are very slow, but very smart. Yes, even Dave down the pub, very smart. CPUs are very exceedingly stupid, but super fast at being stupid. And so all of our modern code is all based around how do we take advantage of something that can reliably be very stupid very fast and produce big useful things from that. So let's talk about what we can do in a modern process. Let's start with something really basic. We're gonna move some data around. Now I'm gonna introduce some terms here that really matter. Back in my original diagram, we had this thing called registers, where I changed where I had my little location where I said, hey, we have a slot for A and a slot for B, and then they became registers. And that's what they're known in any microprocessor architecture um, that are the slots that you can put things in. They are the temporary little tiny scratch pads that the CPU has to work with. Uh, and basically anything a CPU does, in the end of the day, has to be in that register. That registers are extremely fast, but they're extremely small. So you basically have registers in the CPU, and then you have RAM, the mainstream remote ac uh, uh, random access memory that's available in the uh, computer itself, not part of the chip, not part of the actual CPU. So let's talk about the most simple basic operation I wanna do. I just want to set A equals to B. Now in this case, um, let's just assume for a minute that A is a, a register, and B is a location in memory. So the actual code to do that, and for today's examples, I'm using Intel 32-bit assembler, um, is this basic instruction called move, is what actually happens in the CPU. Move, and you give it the destination you want it to move, and then the location in memory you want to move from. It's a weird, goofy syntax. So move, EAX, comma, and then that square brace, ECX plus four. What that actually means is, Move EAX means move into this register, this value from memory, ECX plus four. Now, actually, I need to correct myself. This, this um, A equals B is actually showing two variables in memory, sorry, where A and B are two variables in your program, which means they exist in main RAM. You can't do an operation between memory to memory. can't be done uh, because the memory itself is not a CPU. So instead, we have to pull one of those values into, into the CPU and then push it back out to where we want it in RAM. So, and that's what we're doing. That first statement is we're pulling the value of B into, into a register. And the second statement is taking that value and pushing it back into A. Now you'll notice you don't see A or B in that code, which is a little weird. What's this square brackets ECX plus four? Why is it plus four? And then we have square brackets around ECX. What's that mean? Well, the syntax for that, that is really square brackets around a register means don't write to the register, write to the location in memory that is specified by this register. So if the register has the value 42, you're writing to memory location 42. That's where you start writing, I should say. Um, so what we're doing here, we see ECX plus four and ECX. We're actually, believe it or not, these are two variables in RAM and, uh, and there's a 32-bit processor, so call them two numbers. Well, one of them's four bytes and then the next variables is the next four bytes. So they're literally in order, four bytes, then four bytes. So to get to the second variable, if we have our register pointing to the to start of A, our second variable starts four bytes later at B. And again, if you look at this and think to yourself, oh my gosh, that seems extraordinarily fragile. How would you ever know when you write code this way? You've now discovered why nobody writes code this way anymore. Because this is assembler language and essentially nobody writes at this level anymore. This is what we have modern higher level languages for to track this stuff, but it's actually the way the hardware works. And that's useful to know because when we think about optimizing performance or trying to work out why the machine does what it does, at the end of the day, you can't 
No matter what programming language you have, you can't make this hardware do something it was not built to do. It doesn't matter if you're using F sharp, Rust, Go, C sharp, JavaScript. At the end of the day, everything you write must run on this hardware. And it has to express itself in these primitive functions, one way or another. So just to move memory between two, lo two locations, we first have to pull it into a register and then take it from that register and write it back out to the other location in memory. Now, let's talk about what I mean by a pointer again. It's why I want to refresh that thought, that square brackets ECX. Well, so let's say that the value in the ECX register was the guy you see on here. Now, this is in hex. Don't worry too much about that. But you know, you notice it's all zeros and A. So what that really means is if we go down to the address A in RAN, that's where our variable starts. So when we say square brackets ECX, we say, don't take the value of ECX, take the value of ECX and go to that location in memory. And when we do that, we see that we actually get, if we take the four bytes going from there, we get that value, which is um, the actual value we're trying to pull out of memory and we load it into the register. So. We do this all the time because it's the way we actually reference memory, pull things in and out of memory. Fortunately, every this is one of the, this is one of the first things that compiler developers automated. So you didn't have to think too much in these terms. All right, so that's a very basic operation. Let's do another very basic operation. Let's say that we want to push something onto that stack we had and pull it back off. Now it turns out there's a special register just for working with the stack, that hardware stack that it has. Because the stack we talk about that's in the microprocessors, not for your use, it's really for the CPU's use. It's a built-in construct, but nobody uses it in the program. If you go into .NET and say, oh, I want me a stack, you don't get the hardware stack. You get a normal code implementation of a data structure and data work. This is, this is the way we work at the one that's actually built into the microprocessor, because it has a special purpose. So we push and pop things working from what's called the stack pointer. So in fact, the stack pointer tracks this value for us of where it, where in memory is the stack right now? What 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 is the basically where what, what's the end of the top item of the stack? So for example, let's say we the stop statement here we're pushing a register onto the stack. So push EAX takes the value from EAX, pushes it onto the stack. So imagine like again sheet of paper on the stack. The next statement push square brackets ECX. As you just talked about that's the pointer. So it says don't push ECX on the stack, take the value from memory that ECX points to, push that on the stack. Now when we pop them, you notice how my pop statements, I have written the same order to my push, which means that I went push, push. But when I pop, I get this guy out and pop syntax tells you where you write it into. So I'm taking this value and I'm gonna go put it back in that EAX register. And then I pop again, I'm gonna take this value and I'm gonna go put it back in memory at that address pointed to by ECX. Effectively, what we actually just did here was swap these two values in a super inefficient way, right? Because if I push value one and then two, and then I pop them back, uh, this one into one and that one into two, I basically swapped what was in one and what was in two in a super inefficient way. So you wouldn't actually do this, but that's the meaning of what happened here because the stack is last in, first out. Having put behind us some of that more obtuse code, let's look at something more practical so you can see how it works. Again, so let's start with it. number one, uh, if we want to do something really primitive, let's just do an addition where I want to get into A, so variable A, um, the value of A plus B. And in this case, actually, I'm going to do it quickly with registers. So register A equal value of A plus B. Let's assume I already had them in registers. Well, so. Um, the top one's pretty straightforward. I can just say like, okay, let me go ahead and, and just add EAX and EBX together. Now, when you do that assembler operation, the way this works is you actually, when you specify an add, you, spe you actually specify the destination register as part of the, of the operation. So add EAX EBX actually says, make EAX equal to EAX plus EBX. And I can also do that with a constant. So I could add a constant to EAX, and in fact, what we actually end up doing, and then is EAX becomes EAX plus that constant. More useful, right, is the second one. And this gets back to using our variable syntax again, where if I just want to do A plus B equals C and, you know, actually have that result. So, set, so if you think about the way you might write it in most programming language, it might be like C, set variable C to be equal to variable A plus variable B. Well, to do that, I, first off, I can't work, if A and B point to RAM, I can't do it in one operation. I can't take those two values out of RAM 
and, and put the result back in RAM. Not allowed. So I first have to pull um, at least one of these guys in an Intel processor. Least one of these guys must come into a register. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, hey, I want to move the address, the, the basically the, the value pointed to by ECX, that's our A, into the EAX register. Now I'm going to add to that the value pointed to by ECX plus four, which is where my B variable started. I'm going to add that to my EAX register, which then the result ends up in EIX. And I'm going to move that into the location ECX plus eight. Why eight? Well, if I dimmed my variables A, B, C, and RAM, if this is at byte zero, B starts at plus four, C starts plus eight because an integer is four bytes wide on a 32-bit processor. What I want you to really take away from this though is that's three statements to do an add, like literally the simplest algorithmic operation you can do, three statements of assembler to do that. And that's in an Intel processor. If this was an ARM processor, it would actually be more than that by design. So just even simple things when you actually get down to the machine level of what it's running can involve a lot of code uh, because processors are stupid, but they can do a lot of stupid things really fast. Now you wouldn't get far if all you could do is basic math. Inevitably, most of, I don't know what your programs look like, but mine end up with tons of if then else blah blah statements in them, tons and tons of this stuff. So how do we do that in the processor? Well, let's say I want to say, hey, if A is less than B, then I want you to inc uh, add one to A. Fair enough. So to do that, first off, we actually have to compare A and B. And just as before, since they're both memory variables, I can't just directly compare them. I got to move one into a register. <laughs> so in this case, we're moving um, A, the value of A into the EBX register. And then we're going to compare it with the value of B. Now you notice I just said compare there. That's what the CMP means, compare. But how do I get my less than, greater than, or whatever? Well, interestingly enough, you do it in the next statement. The way compares work in processors is a two-step process where you first say, do a compare, and it literally does every compare, basically. And then the next statement you say, okay, cool. Now, in this situation, I want you to jump somewhere else. So JGE stands for jump if greater than or equal. Now you notice I said less than up above. Why, am I, why don't I have a jump less than? And the answer gets back to, because hardware guys don't like to implement anything they don't absolutely have to implement, and a less than and a greater than or equal than are conjugates, just depending on which side you put the thing on. So they make you just put it in the right way, so they only have to have one of those two operations, because they're big on conserving all the hardware. Um, so I uh, just saw a question in chat, by the way, from a couple of minutes ago, so uh, on, on the stack. Um, you, would, uh, you wouldn't actually use that to swap variables in, in RAM, uh, and the reason is it's super slow, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. It'd be way too slow to do. It'd be valid, but super slow. Because we, we, near the end of the talk, we talk about the relative performance of different things, and you'll be shocked how bad things vary, and it matters a lot when you, at, the, at the lower level. And that's really what you're paying for when you buy a compiler, is the intelligence of the compiler developers to, to know that when you say do this, in this exact circumstance, this is the fast way to make it happen. So uh, with JGE, we're basically saying jump of greater than equal to a label point called exit, which will be some address of the program. Then we're jumping around in this case, because we don't have a less than operator, we're jumping around our actual work that we want to do in the then case. And then exit ends up pointing to whatever's next. So just to sequence through this again, so if A is less than B, I first, I have to execute that compare. To do that, I got to get one of those values into, into a register do the compare, and then using the operations I have, in this case, jump greater than or equal to, I jump around, because that's the opposite of the case I'm looking for, I jump around the additional work to just continue on with basically what would it be after that if-then structure. Now, I'm cheating here. You notice I say increment e ECX, so increment our variable A, and I'm cheating. I'm using the method there is an increment operator built into the hardware and that A equals A plus one is really just incrementing A by one. So I'm cheating. But in your real world, often it's not, your actual logic's more complicated than this. So let's, let's up the bar slightly. Hey, if A is less than B, then I wanna call a function called do more math. And I'm American, so let's do more math, not mass. So uh, first thing we do is we've gotta go ahead and, and again, pull one of those values into RAM, do our compare, jump JG exit. Now I have a syntax called call. That's how we 
basically say, at this point, I want you to transfer execution to a subroutine. Call do more math. And then there's our exit, whatever's next. Now, here's where things get a little entertaining. Here's my little do more math function. It's a label in my code somewhere. And it says, hey, I want you to add 24 to that integer value stored into ECX. And then ret, return to wherever you came from. So I got call and I got ret. Call, return. And so when you return, you're going to end up basically executing whatever that exit value pointed at. Now, if you're looking at this and seeing, thinking like, that seems suspiciously too straightforward. You're right. It is suspiciously too straightforward. Under the covers, call is actually a shorthand for doing a bunch of work. Because remember, processors, stupid but fast. To do that, we actually have to push. <laughs> uh, this is where we start using our stack. We push the state of all of our registers that we need to preserve onto the stack. Tick, tick, tick. And then we push our instruction pointer that tells us where to get back to, because the instruction pointer is the thing that advances through the code, like a little pointer down a recipe, telling us where we are. Then we actually push our base pointer that tells us where the, the table stack is. So the way you think of this is, imagine I have a table, and I'm stacking papers on the table. The base pointer points to the surface of the table. So if I want to protect you from touching this stuff, whoever, whatever code I have later, I can move the base pointer up so that I've acted like I put a table over my stack and you can't mess with the stuff below the table you're on. So I push my base pointer. I then make that the stack pointer. Now I can actually transfer control to the subroutine. All of these things here are actually injected by the assembler compiler to say like, oh, you said call. That actually means do this stuff. Uh, and then transfer control to the subroutine. Now, when I return, I have to unroll all of that because I have to restore the state of the processor back. Because if you think about it, I might have working variables in those registers, right? Another state, when I call the subroutine, when I come back, I need to keep to get those registers back to how they were. But because it's a stack, we do it in reverse order. The first thing we do is we reset the uh, base pointer to be, um, <clears throat> we basically undo our, our, our stack change. We get rid of that extra table blocking us from going below it. We then start popping things off in the reverse order and get our registers back. And then finally, boom, we're back to where we were and executing forward. All of this is done under the covers, but this is why it has to have a hardware notion of a stack. Because if it didn't have this, you couldn't basically do subroutine calls safely. And so this is why it has its own stack and it's built in. This behavior of the stack pointer base pointer is also really essential for doing like exceptions and other things where you want to be able to unwind the stack entirely because it lets us basically unwind back to the base pointer and know that we've now thrown out all of that error state down below. Now, when you talk, in fact, uh, in modern languages, uh, you, you will, we, we, you'll sometimes hear people say, oh, that's allocated on the stack or that's allocated on the heap. This is, in fact, the stack they're talking about when they say it's allocated on the stack. It's this thing that the processor is using to track the exact state of where it is in the program and build up this state of information. A stack overflow is exception is when it has done so much of this, it's run out of the memory region that it's allowed to use for the stack because all the stack stuff is done in RAM. When we're pushing and popping, it's not going to a register, it's going to main RAM. And that means that it's only as fast as reading and writing RAM is, which is not as fast as, we, as registers are by a good bit. Now, this was a simple example. We make it slightly more complicated. It's A is less than B, then do more math. And I'm passing those variables because we almost always pass variables into functions. Then in fact, it makes it things slightly more complicated. We have what we did before of our setup, but then we have to push in our variables. So we said we wanted to pass A and B into the function. Well, we do it by pushing them onto the stack. Then we transfer control to the subroutine. The code in the subroutine knows to go read backwards from the stack, basically going back to read the variables. And that's also why, by the way, you notice we push the variables in reverse order. I said on this previous screen, we said we're calling do more math A comma B, but when we pushed them on the stack, we pushed B then A. This gets to, by the way, fundamentally why languages that support optional parameters do it at the end, because it means that it basically they can know on the receiving side, as they read back, they read back until they run in, into that base pointer and go like, well, that's all you passed me, because I've, I've hit that pointer point now. There can't be anything more um, for me to read. And it lets them implement in hardware efficiently and correctly
that idea of how you pass things to another function. So, uh, so it has to be done in that order. Now, when we return, we have to we when we when we do that first step of enrolling the base pointer and stack pointer, we are throwing out those extra variables we pushed automatically. That's also, by the way, when you de some, declare something in your program just in line, it tends to do it on the stack for the same reason because that first step of doing a return will automatically free all that RAM back up by just resetting that base pointer. Now it becomes memory it can use again, and it doesn't care. And then we unroll it. So this basic structure is what's essential to making any modern program of any complexity work, and it needs that hardware stack. Now, the good news is we're never going to we're never going to have to drill through this sort of assembler slog again. This is what's happening under the covers for you automatically in the way the microprocessor actually works. So as what you can see from this though is that at the low level, these instructions are very fragile. Like you have to do everything exactly right in exactly the right order. You have to do it, um, they, they are very stupid and they're very simple. And that's essential to making the CPU fast. But frankly, that's why it's taken us years and years and years to make this stuff reliable um, because even a tiny little error means the entire state of the processor becomes untrusted and that's it, you're restarting. All right. Life wouldn't be very interesting though if we, um, if we just had very simple blocks of, 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 of instructions. Um, furthermore, for us to understand the performance I was starting to lead into a little bit there of, hey, let's talk about how we get this from memory and how we do these other things. We need to understand a bit about how we actually take those instructions and the CPU executes them. How does it actually do the work and know what work to do? So the basic cycle, again, is common for all modern CPUs. And it works like this. You fetch the, the, the next instruction you want to do. So you take that little pointer we've been maintaining of where are we uh, on the program? Where do we jump to or what are we executing next? We load that into the instruction register. We then have to decode it, decide what the heck does it even say? What is this instruction that I've loaded to even know what it means? We may, depending on the instruction, have to go fetch data. Like if it, if it said, hey, I want you to add, you know, this register in that location in RAM. Well, now we have to go off and get that value from RAM somehow. Then we go ahead and do the work it asks us to do. Take those two things, add them together, do whatever you want, and then put the results somewhere. And then we start all over again. So this basic five, step cycle is the is the is in concept the way any microprocessor works now let's walk it through that diagram we started with so here's the diagram we started with and just to refresh ourselves again you notice a couple of things on here we've got our um, our output register here ax we've got our alu which was the logic unit the thing that actually knows what to do bx and dx and, and then and there are conceptually other ones in here right that are little temporary storage locations to feed that into we have main memory but you can see, like, you can't go from a memory directly into this thing. You've pretty much got to take the value and put it in a register, then work it. Um, we have that instruction point that shows us where are we in our instruction. And we have, uh, from that instruction, we actually load, have one on deck, that's the thing we're running, and boom, our control unit to tell the CPU what to do. Let's go through that cycle we just talked about, though, and see how this all plays out in the hardware. So the first thing we had to do was fetch the next instruction, right? So there we go. We're actually, um, Going instruction memory is just RAM like anything else. Our instruction pointer points to that memory and, and says, hey, here's the next one on deck that I need you to, to, to load. We load that into our register. And then we move that instruction pointer forward to the end of the instruction we just loaded. So it's ready to point to the next instruction, basically. Okay, cool. Then we have to decode that sucker. That means putting the CPU into the state where it's ready to evaluate it and execute what that instruction was. We may have to go fetch, fetch data from RAM and put it into one of our registers to actually process it. Then we do the actual work and that results in the, uh, the outcome being put in that register we have for temporary uh, results. And then finally, we probably are taking that result and st either stuffing it back into main memory or we might be feeding it back into a register, whatever we need to do next with that instruction. Now, that you'll, one thing that's interesting you'll notice about the diagram I just did was, Virtually no box was lit up in more than one stage of what we just processed. And that turns out to matter a lot. The way that the machine goes through that sequence of that, those five steps I just talked about is controlled by the system clock. The system's clock is something you've, you've surely heard of. It's basically an item that is the metronome 
keeping time inside the microprocessor that sets the cadence that we step forward from stage to stage to stage. Now, uh, the clock is generally implemented as a square wave pulse. So we, we talk about the clock cycle being the step from each time it goes from low to high. So in fact, if we did that, say, um, you know, over and over and over again, that's our step function clock. And at three gigahertz, which is a pretty fast speed for a modern microprocessor, it does that three billion times per second, which means that the width of one of those cycles from when it goes from low to high, back to low, and it gets, it gets ready to go high again, is one three billionth of a second, so 0.33 nanoseconds, which in terms of the speed of light is about that, uh, 0.33 is about that far. Uh, light can go in that amount of time which is to say that that is a crazy short moment of time. Now, what the CPU wants to do then is each time the system clock rolls forward a click, it wants to take on the next step of the work. So it might start by fetching our instruction, decode that instruction, fetch the data we need, execute that instruction, write the result back. And then having completed those five stages of processing, now I fetch the next instruction. Now, from that basic standpoint, you can see then that the amount of time it takes to, to actually do one thing you've asked the CPU to do is actually five of these clock cycles to do it, to do instruction, decode, fetch, execute, and write back. Now, one of the things that they identified in the actually early 80s was, gosh, if you go back to our previous diagram, much of the CPU is not actually in use most of the time, it's used for only one of those phases. So couldn't we get ahead of ourselves? What if after we did, you know, had say one operation going where we were decoding one instruction, what if we then started decoding the next instruction? So we're always using each bit of the hardware every cycle, just looking ahead to the next thing. So for example, you see here that we might start by, you see how this layers up where we fetch an instruction and then that work goes on into the decoder. But once that goes in the decoder, we start fetching the next instruction. And then once that thing's decoded, it goes to get memory. Meanwhile, the decoder moves on to the next instruction and on and on and on and on and on. So that we're moving a bunch of things down through the line like you might an assembly line in a factory or a car. And in fact, uh, this is referred to as pipelining. And it was one of the first real compute tricks that was introduced in the mid 80s to make CPUs a lot faster. And it works to a point. Um, the only real tricky things we have to do, if you notice is that if I go to execute something, I might need the result from the previous operation to work. So we just have to add some shortcuts here that let me basically go, oh, let me take the result from an execute and just put it right back into myself immediately so that I can basically build on top of it. And as long as I can do that, I can kind of get down to one instruction per clock cycle. Now that's no, that's a bit of a bath there, but um, I can roughly get conceptually down to that point where now I'm, I'm doing one thing per clock cycle once I have filled up my pipeline of work. Now where this all sounds great, right? We've now gone from something that maybe took five clock cycles to get work done to one fifth. Sounds like we've really invented free money here, but it's not as good as that because the problem is that most of our code is full of stuff like this, where you say, hey, if this is true, then do this other thing, do this thing. Otherwise, do something different. Now we're into a problem, because let's say that I'm going through my code, and I start the same thing. So if A is less than B, okay, we've done that before. I'm going to jump through, and in this case, I'm going to go to my else clause if that qualifies. Uh, so in one case, I'm incrementing, and in the next case, I have to jump now over my, my else clause work. Otherwise, I'm doing this other math. And then finally, I'm out. Here's where the problem comes in. If I'm walking down this instruction by instruction, like, cool, doing a move, no problem. Next instruction to compare, great. Let's get that in the pipeline, keep going. JGELs, uh-oh. I don't know right here, This well, this is actually kind of okay, but I, I can do this knowing that, okay, I'm gonna compare the result of that. I just need to shortcut the result in. But where am I gonna go next? Am I gonna execute this add instruction? Or am I gonna do an increment? I don't know. Right? There's no way for me to know until I've done this compare whether this is the next instruction or that's the next instruction. This became, be, creates the rabbit hole of virtually all of the computer optimization that's been happening in CPUs from around about 89 until now, is what do you do with this? 
Because basically, you've got a couple of choices. You could do nothing, where you basically you go through and it's like, oh, okay, you know what? Until I do a compare, I don't know where I'm going next. So now I stall my pipeline, and I don't let any, I don't pick either of these instructions. I just kind of wait. Of course, in that case, I'm falling immediately back to that five steps to be able to get the next things done. That's pretty bad. The next option I could do is I could guess. I could basically say like either I'm just going to always assume we take a, take the jump or always assume we don't. As long as I can throw away the result and know in time, I can make a guess. And that was one of the first things people did because, in fact, just because I've started loading the result doesn't mean that I've stored it back. And as long as I don't take it out of that output register and put it somewhere else, I can undo the work I did. And that's called speculative execution. You're executing something speculatively, hoping it's going to be the path to go. And some processors even execute both. This gets into an interesting digression. If you ever wondered why, what makes, for example, an Intel Xeon processor different than, say, a desktop or a laptop processor, uh, one of the major thing differences is that they put extra hardware in those higher-end server processors. So when they're faced with a compare like this, they have enough extra hardware they just do both both things. In fact, they have enough extra hardware that they can do both things. And then if those two result in another jump statement, they can do both of those things. And if those two result in another jump, they can do both of those things, all before knowing which of the original outcomes they were going to take. That's referred to as a superscalar processor, and and it's a lot of extra hardware. But if you are, if you basically, if you have the power budget, where you can afford to actually um, power all those extra, all that extra little bits of the CPU, and you have the space budget, you can put a big enough chip in your box. Why not? And it gives you consistent high throughput, uh, even in the face of code that's doing all kinds of if them else stuff. And it's a core thing that's fundamental to particularly the Xeon process, but it's also, by the way, what differentiates, say, an i7 from a laptop processor. Um, because laptops are really, at the end of the day, very much about how, how can I spend the least amount of power uh, you know, in my i3, i5, particularly laptop-grade processor, versus, um, oh, no, I've got you know, a good thermal budget where I can cool myself. And I, so like a desktop i7, i9 actually has some of that ability where it will just execute both cases, and then it'll throw one of those two out. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful cheat. And now, this is everything we've been talking about is happening inside the computer. But if all we did was worked inside of our CPU, then we'd never be able to see the outcome of our program. We'd never be able to build them into bigger and bigger things that actually achieve the results that we do today. So how does that all come together? It, it turns out it's, uh, it's where things basically get complicated and slow is when you start going outside of the processor. And let's get back to one of our simpler examples where we said, hey, I want to go ahead and grab a value from memory. So this is move EBX ECX means go to the location of main memory, 22 by ECX, take that value, put it in RAM at EBX. It turns out in any remotely modern computer, accessing a location of RAM is tricky. And this all happens for you, but the hardware has to deal with it. So the first thing I have to do actually is cheat and look up and say, where is that value actually in memory? Because all modern microprocessors lie to their own CPU, basically, or the instructions about where things are in RAM. They do it to support virtual memory. So the first thing I have to do is actually take that value of ECX and go like, okay, cool, but where is this actually in memory? And I have to use something called a, a TLB or translation look aside buffer to take that value and translate it to um, what page it should be on and then where is that page actually in physical memory, if it is? Because if it's not in physical memory, I have to invoke the virtual memory subsystem, go get it off of disk or wherever storing virtual memory and put it in play. And this matters because in our modern applications, we act like we have an infinite amount of RAM. And to make that trick work, we had to have memory virtualization. So uh, this is an essential trick where your program runs thinking it has all the memory in the world and it's the only thing running. But eventually, you have to interact with the hardware where it says, ah, that thing you think of as page, you know, 2FC6E, eh, it's actually in main RAM as 3A6C2. And it does this by looking this up in a buffer that, that, um, that, that basically is a little cache for this value. Otherwise, I have to do the hard math and go look up in RAM itself to see where is this actually. Um, from that then, what it's really desperately hoping is this value is in cache, because inside of the microprocessor, there is a fast staging area 
that is your level one cache in the chip. How big it is, how you access it varies a lot by physical processor, but it's a thing. It's essential because if, if I can go find in cache, it's a lot faster. How does we do that? Well, we literally have a hardware thing that can almost instantaneously go and say, well, if this is the address you're looking for, I'm going to basically do a hardware level operation of hoping it's in cache and, and it either is or isn't. If it's not, I get a squash. If it is, I just get the value and done. The reason that this technology really matters is performance. When we go to actually pull things out of RAM, the time it takes to pull a value out of level one cache in a modern CPU is, and this is a desktop CPU data I'm using right here, by the way, laptops are generally slower. It takes about four clock cycles to get something out of level one cache. So remember that step where we said, hey, just go fetch, a, fetch the data I need for my operation. You got one clock cycle to get it done. Well, in truth, it takes at least four clock cycles to do that step. And that's if it's in level one cache. But if it's not in that cache, we might go to level two cache. Now level two cache, generally bigger, but slower. It takes 12 clock cycles to get something from level two cache. If it's not there and we're really lucky, so this is a desktop CPU, it actually has a level three cache. That's cool. That's much bigger yet, but it takes 36 clock cycles to get a value out of RAM. Now this is a desktop CPU, it actually has all three of these levels, but the performances fall off as you go. You'll notice that last one says four megabytes. If you go look up the spec on a processor, they'll say like, oh, it's an Intel i7 and it runs at three gigahertz and it's four cores with X of cache. They're referring to that level three cache right there. That's what they're actually referring to. And that's 36 clock cycles. So if you think about it, that's a lot of time. If getting the value out of a register is one clock cycle, it takes 36 times that amount of time to get it from cache. And cache is still fast. Why do I say that? Because God help me if I have to go to main RAM. Even on a desktop system with very good memory, 200 clock cycles to get the value out of main RAM. So you can see why we have these levels of cache, because if I have to stall to get the value from actual memory, holy cow is that slow relative to my caches, relative to uh, the registers in the CPU. The best way to visualize this is for me to scale the numbers a little bit. If one CPU, in the real world, one CPU cycle we said for a three gigahertz processor was about 0.33 nanoseconds, very fast. But let's say that was one second. Let's pretend for a second that was one second, because we can get our head around one second at a time. You know, it's, about that long. Well, level one cache access then would take three seconds. Level two cache, take eight seconds. If I have to go out to main memory, that's 200 clock cycles. That's 3.3 minutes of time. Now you can see the relative weight of why, like, oh my gosh, this stuff gets expensive, even to access RAM, but we're not done yet. If I have an SSD, we're talking days to get data off of that. And this is the things we consider high speed storage days. If I get off hard disk, we're literally going to be talking about entirely new JavaScript frameworks and the time frame it would take to get that value back. Now, if I have to reach across the internet and go from here to Oslo, um, there will be children grown up and in school by the time we get back that value. So this kind of helps you think about why modern performance is really about the most important thing you can do is keep things in close by, keep them in the processor or right maybe in main memory or God help you maybe on SSD. And if you're really unlucky on local disk, because if you have to go across the internet to get it, wow, is that slow. So all these pieces build up and they, um, they dramatically affect the performance. Now, most of the time we can rely on our compilers to help us out with this and make this stuff fast, but they still need our help um, in certain places. When we do uh, things where we allocate too much memory or we use something that's memory inefficient, we're really hurting ourselves because of the way that caching works. If you start blowing caching in your core, in your processor, you can, there's no amount of other clever coding that's going to get you around that, that performance issue. One last step then before we've scaled up, we've been talking about uh, how one program works by one thread of execution. So one thread of execution, meaning one instruction pointer, one program, one keeping track of where we are, one bit of jumping around. But modern apps don't work that way. I mean, this was the way early 80s stuff worked, you know, when we had DOS or MS-DOS and we fired things up and the way we went, that's how this went. But today, everything we do now runs our modern um, 
uh, preemptive multiprocessing operating systems with safeties built into them. So how does that work? Well, we have threads of execution. We have multiple of them in a process. Uh, a way to think of a process, amongst other things, the process thinks it's the only thing running on the computer. It thinks it has all the memory address space in the world, and it is only able to view its own memory, basically. Now, we have a thing called a kernel. This is in true of any modern operating system. They use a kernel, which is the thing that actually interfaces with the hardware or the virtualization layer beneath it. Windows has a kernel, Linux, et cetera. And that kernel basically defines a spec of how you might talk to get into the hardware, as well as how does it protect and bound, uh, move data between other processes. Distinction, distinction between kernel and process really matters because if the kernel crashes, everything's gone. You're rebooting the, the processor. But if a process crashes, because it's, it's looking at a false sort of somewhat virtualized view of the world, that's okay. It can go away and the whole rest of the machine keeps running. Um, many folks may not remember, but this was the, 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 the holy grail of late 90s or eight, late 80s, early 90s development was affordable desktop systems that had true preemptive multitasking where you could have an application die and not have to restart the machine. Because for the longest time, it was like, well, that crashed. I guess I should reboot before I try another run because God knows what that did. Um, and and that, those problems are essentially behind us now, really in a, to a remarkable degree. But it took a tremendous amount of engineering over a long period of time. This isn't just there for reliability, though, and safety, because a process can only, should be able, only be able to see its information uh, in its scope. But this also affects your application performance. So, for example, a single web page in most modern browsers is done as a process behind the scenes. There's a process that correlong, cor 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 correlates to that web page and its JavaScript execution and what have you. And they might have multiple threads of execution. Now, as they, the thing is, you, they might have a bunch of threads, but you only have so many cores on your CPU. So every once in a while, a CPU has to stop working on one thread of execution and switch to another thread. And that's called a context switch. And you can see that happen um, if you go look at, there's other, in, in the lower level metrics of looking at the machine or operating system performance, you'll see it refer to how many context switches per seconds it have to do. And basically, if you have more threads of execution than you have number of cores, which is essentially always the case, you're gonna have context switching where it has to stop doing work on one thread and turn around and start doing work on another thread. Uh, and that has a certain performance impact for it to do that. Additionally, every time your thread of execution goes in and out of the kernel, because it's switching secure modes in the processor itself, uh, that has a certain amount of performance penalty for the CPU to basically say like, okay, hold on a second, you're going from your code into the kernel, which means that I'm switching from this security mode to that security mode. I now allow these operations, but don't allow those operations, things like that. Uh, the way I look at memory becomes different, et cetera. Um, so for it to do all of that takes a little bit of time for it to switch modes like that, that mode switch from user to kernel mode. And this notably impacts performance because for example, if you have something like video drivers or real time IO, that can really get held up if you're doing a lot of these switches in and out of kernel mode because of the security constraints for that. And the performance for that is pretty, pretty dramatic in terms of what it does because let's look at what's happening back in the hardware again. Every time I switch the context switch, I have to save the state of every one of these registers somewhere so that I can get back to this thread of execution later because the thread of execution is really defined by that instruction pointer plus the state of all those other registers in the CPU. And I have to put it somewhere. In fact, I put it in RAM is what I do, or in a, in a cache buffer inside the chip that's dedicated for this. Uh, but that takes time to take all those values, put them somewhere, make sure I, I'm all good to go. And if I'm switching to something else, I have to load their values in and then say go and, and fire off from there. So if we compare these guys, so a mode switch happens when we have same thread of execution, but we're going into that high security context of the kernel. It takes about 50 nanoseconds on a modern processor to do that. Same processor I was using before, a desktop processor. So that's a lot of time. In fact, by, if we scaled one clock cycle to be a second, that's two and a half minutes of time. So if you imagine again, your program's happily run along, brrr, then you access a kernel resource, like a handle to a file system, that kind of thing. It's effectively waiting like you know two and a half minutes of our scale time, 15 nanoseconds in reality, to make that transition, uh, to be and then be able to do the work it wants to do. But at least that's fairly predictable, as in like you 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 know that you can do that in a bounded period of time. 
context switching to a different thread of execution is much worse. It takes about 3,000 nanoseconds. The scale time is 16 minutes. This talk will be over and done. We'll be maybe having our final chats in the Slack channel by the time that context switch completes. So if you take nothing else away from, from this, this thread of the conversation, it's that uh, context switching is the worst thing next to talking across the internet that you can do to your application for performance. What does this mean for you as a developer? Well, to delve into that for a second, it means that having multiple threads is great right up until you have more threads that want to run than you have cores in your CPU. Because the minute you do that, they're going to start context switching a lot. And you will context switch yourself to death. Because the amount of time it takes to switch context is very long. And if you then have it so they have to let go, then start waiting for work another thread does, or they can't do enough work, you have not uh, basically made efficient use of your CPU. It's always busy, but it's basically always busy just interrupting itself back and forth um, doing things. So you're not getting useful work done. All right. Let me hit the summary then. So very simply, CPUs do simple things very fast. They're the opposite of people. They're stupid, but very fast at being stupid, whereas people are very, uh, are very uh, slow, but can do, think through very complicated phenomena. The instruction set is what determines that compatibility. What we talked through today was the Intel instruction set. ARM instruction set looks a little differently. ARM is what's used in virtually every mobile device. Uh, even your main RAM, even in the best system, is dramatically slower than the CPU's register. Uh, so what that does mean, by the way, is if you want to speed up your program, there's really two things to take away. One was my don't overthread thing. But the second thing is just allocate less RAM. If there's any of you folks who have been following the .NET Core team's development work over the past, I don't know, four years, the common thread they talk about all the time is don't allocate RAM. Just don't allocate RAM. If you can get away with not allocating, it's much faster. And that's because in the end, it really is. The, the smaller you can make the memory footprint of the data you're working with in your code, the faster your application will run, all, uh, you know, general other things being equal. Uh, and it's one of the most important things you can do to speed things up, which I'm sure it's kind of awkward for someone to talk about when they're, you know, .NET has a managed runtime, which means it's already sacrificing memory efficiency in a number of ways for programming efficiency and, re and reliability. Finally, and because this is, uh, you know, of the time slot for this talk, I wasn't able to get into this very far, but there are two types of processors out there, pretty much the whole world is involved into. RISC chips, the most common today, one being ARM processors, which stands for reduced instru instruction set computing, and CISC chips, which are only ever built by Intel now, which is your uh, I-86, uh, you know, your standard desktop PC server, that kind of thing. RISC heavily biased towards small, low power, low thermal, like you can't drain a lot of heat scenarios. CISC is kind of the opposite optimization, maximum throughput, um, uh, maximum performance. So um, this is why we've devolved into the duopoly we see today where uh, all of our phones are using risk chips of one variant or another. Even when Intel trying to be in the mobile phone market does it with a dedicated chip, it's a risk chip. Sys chips, though, still own the laptop market and up for the moment. I know Apple's about to change the game on that a little bit, but they still basically do own that market. Um, and it comes down to uh, Sys chips have a high, it basically comes down to that instruction set makes it so useful to still be able to run Intel programs. And Intel has innovated like crazy to inside of their chip come up with tricks where they basically can run much of what you do like it was an ARM or a RISC chip and only fall back to the bigger uh, slower sets where they have to. Uh, and in so doing, they kind of cheated death on that architecture. And it gives them very predictably consistent high performance where you can afford the, literally the power to the CPU, like the, you know, the, the, the um, amperage to the chip and where you can afford to dissipate then all that power as heat, because that's where it all goes. So, and with that, uh, I thank you very much. Thank you for coming to the talk. And uh, if you have any questions, please put them in Slack. I will stay as long as it takes to get those answered. Love those questions. Um, if you want to tell me about how I've totally wasted an hour of your time or you could have gone to much better talks, there's some great contact info there for that. Uh, best place to publicly rant to me is, is on Twitter. If you, if you want to do it privately, there's my email address as well and the blog for my company uh, and, and one of our core products. There's one question I see in Slack that's a great one because um, I didn't get hit it, which what does the CPU do 
when basically it fills up cash? And the answer to that is there's dedicated hardware and other tricks that basically make sure that it, it tries to have the right things in cash as it goes. And in fact, let me double back to the slide, just talk a little bit about how that works. Um, so when we go pull something, if, it's, if we miss in level one cash and miss in level two cash and miss in level three cash, hit the main memory, when we actually pull it back, it pops itself into those caches, displacing something else that was one of the last least recently used pages of information. Most caches start off with the basically, whatever I've used most recently, keep that in cache um, as, as a naive algorithm. But the fact is that there's actually extensive work that Intel and different folks do in the hardware to optimize what they evict from cache when and in what circumstances to avoid certain problems. Um, but they basically, when they fill up that four meg of cache, for example, they will go through and when they have to put, when they basically get a miss, they look at the cache and say, great, who's the victim here? Oh, you're the one that's been used the least often? Boom, I get you out. And there's actual, like literally dedicated silicon in the hardware to make that performance. So you can do that in basically make those decisions almost instantaneously. Um, and there's a lot of interesting details in how that works that I unfortunately obviously don't have time to get into in a one hour talk. But this is really what the hardware folks spend their time innovating on is what caches, how big are they? Um, what's the performance of axiom in amount? How clever is our algorithm? How much do we rely on the compiler to do be smart versus we make the chip smart? And that kind of goes back and forth where they'll tell the compiler developers, hey, we want you to optimize what you're doing by, you know, by putting the, the most likely jump first or, or instruction first, that kind of thing, and we'll bias that direction. And, and it, so it kind of goes back and forth from smart compilers then um, to no, let's make the chips smarter because we can't rely on developers ever thinking about performance. Uh, back and forth as chips get bigger and then have to get smaller again, things like that. Any other questions, uh, please pound them in the Slack channel. And uh, really thank you very much for coming to the talk. I really appreciate the number of folks attended. Uh, I know that it's kind of weird doing uh, conferences virtually this year, but uh, stay safe, uh, stay home, take care of yourself and your family. Like to see you next year.